All right, so our next talk, uh, Angie Shu is presenting Defense, Defense, I misspelled it on my sheet, Defense in Depth for Email Security. Um, I just had a coworker give me a good luck fish as I'm talking about fishing today. So um, I might hand that out later. I'm not sure, but I really I like my new little fish here. I'd like to set the stage for this presentation with a quote from Cisco. Customers of all sizes face the same daunting challenge. Email is simultaneously the most important business communication tool and the leading attack vector for security breaches. So, that kind of defines my job. I'm supposed to let through 100% of the good email and stop 100% of the bad email. <laughs> That's definitely a huge challenge and I haven't perfected it yet, but I will tell you some of the things that we're, today that we're doing to try to meet that goal. A little bit about me. I am a cybersecurity engineer at Team Health. I've been working there for about a year and a half. And prior to becoming a cybersecurity engineer, I was a sysadmin in a lot of different companies doing a lot of different things, everything from uh, custom access databases, accounting software support, um, exchange admin, active directory, routers, switches, firewall rules. So all kinds of stuff, a broad range of things. So this is the first job that I've had where I've actually gotten to focus on something so specifically, um, a, a relatively small area of email security. So even though it's a, a very big responsibility, I'm really enjoying being able to hone in and become the SME on this topic. Um, I do get to work from home, which I love. That's a picture of my family there. Those are my boys, Remington and Magnum. They are Great Danes, and our little Mott Beretta, and my very patient husband, Adam. <laughs> I mentioned I work for Team Health, so in case you aren't familiar with that, they, um, they do operate nationwide, um, and they are in, very much in the healthcare industry. They do a lot of different things. They are expanding their telehealth uh, service line right now. Um, they, uh, th one of their primary things is helping to supply doctors for hospitals, especially uh, ERs. And they also do nursing, lots of, lots of medical billing, lots of different things in healthcare. And being in the healthcare industry, um, you may or may not be aware that healthcare is a target, a specific target for cyber criminals. A uh, big reason for that, uh, medical record sells for a lot more on the dark web than a social security number or credit card number. All of the information in a medical record is very valuable and it's, it, they go for a lot more. And so we've got a lot of stuff that we need to protect at Team Health and we take it very seriously. Um, a lot of uh, personal identifiable information, PHI, um, subject to lots of HIPAA regulations that we need to keep an eye on all of that stuff as well. So um, as we are in healthcare um, and we have valuable information, we are a target and we see that in the attacks that come against our network and of course via email. So I'm going to show you some examples of emails that we've gotten in. Um, this first one, you can see how they changed the from to look like it was coming from a legitimate team health source. We see these fake delivery failure notices. Um, lately, I've been seeing a lot of fake voicemail notifications. We've seen fake spam quarantine notifications. Um, so there's there's a a lot of emails in that category. And the other one, you can tell they, they even grabbed our logo. They're trying so hard to make it look legit. They even capitalized Team Health correctly. Uh, and that's actually one of the things that my filters look for is whether or not they have the correct capitalization for Team Health. So they actually uh, checked a mark on that one, unfortunately. 
Um, this one we did actually stop at a filter, but they, they tried really hard. They also, you can see that little black dot area, they addressed to the recipient by name. So they did everything they, they could to try to get someone to click that malicious link. Another couple examples, we see a ton of VIP impersonation. Of course, it's really easy for just about any company to be able to scrape the names of the most important people from websites and LinkedIn. So we have, um, we see lots of emails where they're trying to get direct deposit information, accounts receivable lists, and request gift card purchases on behalf of, a, of a, the CEO. Um, and then uh, another example there, just something, just what might seem like really innocent, um, just a social engineering attempt, just trying to open that line of conversation. What's your cell phone number? So we see lots of these sort of things. We've even seen links in emails that are specific to the recipient. So we look at that malicious link, so we block that website. But you, in the link, um, if they were to click on it, they would know exactly who, that, um, who the person was that clicked because of that very customized link. So I've talked a little bit about why Team Health is a target and why that company needs to take uh, their security very seriously. I'm gonna talk through a couple of the email security systems that we have and then also other, uh, other layers that we have just in case those two systems miss a bad email. So how is Team Health dealing with the onslaught of malicious emails? One thing that they did was they hired me. I think that was a great decision on their part. <laughs> uh, I am the first person that they've had on their SecOps team dedicated to email security. Uh, they, one of these systems that I'm gonna talk about, they were onboarding as I was onboarding the company, so that was brand new to them. And then the other system that I'm going to talk about was being admined by their exchange admin and he didn't really have a lot of time to, to spend tweaking and tuning it. So this, we've taken email security um, to a whole nother level in the last year and a half. Um, I am gonna mention here, we do still have on-prem exchange at Team Health, so you'll hear me mention that. And um, that's been a cost decision for us um, up to this point, and, and I, I'll point out why that would be the case a little bit later. Uh, I'm sure that O365 is going to be inevitable uh, for us, but uh, right now we um, still have on-prem exchange, and that does limit some of the options that we have in terms of email security because so many um, of the email security systems now, especially in the, the um, space that I'm gonna talk, when I talk about armor blocks, especially in that space, they wanna talk directly to O365 via APIs, and they're not really built to even be able to handle on-prem exchange. So the first system I'm, gonna I'm going to talk about is the Cisco Secure Email Cloud Gateway. This is its latest name. If you're familiar with Cisco much, you will know they love to rename things. So this is just the latest name. You may have heard of it referred to as Cisco Ironport. They're still, uh, they still refer to it as that in some areas. Uh, ESA, which is Email Security Appliance. CES, which is Cloud Email Security. And that's the term that I'm going to be using to refer to it today. Um, but this is its new official title, is Cisco Secure Email Cloud Gateway, as they've been doing a lot of rebranding of their names this year with Cisco Secure. Um, do any, does anyone here, have, they, have you ever managed one of these uh, Cisco secure email gateways or work for a company that has this as your SEG? All right, very cool. All right, a couple. Um, I'm not surprised that it isn't a large number of people. I feel that it's a very good product, but it is so customizable that it can be more complex to administer than a lot of the other options. So um, I really like it, I think it does a good job, but it definitely, um, if you're gonna tune it right, it, it takes a lot of time. Uh, what other SEGs do people use in their companies? Um, Proofpoint, Mimecast, call out what, what your company uses for that. Nice try. <laughs> <laughs> 
I guess. Okay. <laughs> there are there are lots of other segs out there. Um, I know Proofpoint and Mimecast are a couple that I run into on a regular basis. Um, Fortinet uh, is one, um, and a lot of them have encrypted email uh, built in, so that's that's part of how I get to see those with the, that email coming in, secure email coming in from our partner organizations. Um, so I will talk through that the Cisco CS has a lot of different layers that an email has to get through before it can be delivered through to on-prem exchange. So I'll talk first about sender reputation. You may have heard of, of Cisco Talos, which is Cisco's threat intelligence um, division. Um, they are constantly looking to see what kind of things are out there, and there are a few different places in the the CES layers that get information from Talos on a regular basis. So the first of those is definitely sender reputation. Um, they, Talos rates all of the mail server IPs out there that it sees on a scale of negative 10 to 10. And then in the Cisco setup, you can say what you want to do based on those ratings. For example, if an email, uh, say a mail server is trying to send an email and its score is negative five. You can have that in a bracket that says, if the reputation is that bad, just block the email, just drop it. Don't even wanna look at it, nothing else. If the reputation is that bad, just get rid of it. Then you can specify another range, say negative two to negative five. Well, this might be a little bit on the edge. Let's, let's allow it, but let's rate limit it. So if it does start sending a ton of bad email, that gives us time to react and block it all together. Uh, so you can have different, you, you can define as many of those ranges as you want with different rate limits. Uh, and then have your big block at the top, like okay, so if it's above a rating of five, then we're just gonna let this in at our normal, um, normal speed, our normal rate limiting. For the email that is allowed through the sender reputation filters, the, that email gets tagged with other information that it gets from Talos. One of the things that it gets tagged with is its geolocation. So where is that mail server located? Uh, another thing that happens in that first stage is it evaluates the email authentication records. So by the time it gets to the, the next stage of message filters, that message has already been tagged with whether or not um, it passed or failed uh, the, those email authentication records, SPF, DKIM, and DMARC. So if you're familiar with um, those and, and getting those set up in DNS, that's definitely something that is checked on the way in. Then we get to the admin defined message filters. This is actually part of the process that you have to access the CLI for with CES. Everything else is in the GUI. So if you're really nerdy and like CLI, this is a fun area to play in with, this, with CES. All of these message, all of the message filters are written in regex. So that stands for regular expression if you're not uh, familiar with that. This is an example of what one of those filters looks like. So basically it's, it's an if-then statement. And you can specify a ton of different parameters. Um, Email comes in with a lot of different headers. You can check all of those. You can check the, the location, the geolocation, which is what this one does. Um, so, for example, we allow, we have a, a whitelist of so mail server locations that we allow email in from, and everything else is blocked by default. So if you try to send an email to us from a mail server in Russia, it's just gonna get dropped. The next filter that CES has is anti-spam. Uh, most companies, I think, um, that put together anti-spam, it's, a, it's a, kind of their own proprietary way of determining that. But what Cisco does with their anti-spam filter is they, again, give a rating to the potential spamminess of the email on a rating of one to 100. 
and then we can choose at what level we're going, how we're going to treat those. For example, uh, we can say that anything with a score of 65 and above is so spammy that we just want to drop it. We don't even want to deal with it. Um, but then there might be a middle range, say 35 to 65, where we're going to mark it as potential spam, and we can treat that differently farther on down the pipeline, which currently today what's happening is that that email will then get delivered to Exchange, but then automatically shunted to the user's junk email folder. So there, there's options there, and you can tune it based on what type of email you seem to get in. Um, then there's an antivirus filter. Uh, which probably doesn't come as a surprise to anybody. CES has a couple different options for that. Um, at Team Health, we're actually using Sophos for that anti-spam layer, uh, or the antivirus layer. And then Cisco AMP. There's, it's Cisco's own advanced malware protection. And this deals specifically with attachments. So if an attachment comes in that CES feels it needs, to, it needs some closer scrutiny, CES can hold that email in quarantine while it uploads that file for analysis. And that, that email just stays there until that verdict comes back as to whether or not it's safe to release. Every once in a while, AMP does miss one. It doesn't happen very often, but sometimes AMP lets an email through, and then later it figures out that it made a mistake. There's a method that it has to talk to our local, our on-prem exchange that says, yo dude, that was an accident, I didn't mean to do that, could you please delete that for me? And then let me know whether or not that was successful. So that's a really nice uh, uh, feature called auto remediation that's in CES. Luckily, it doesn't get it wrong very often, we don't have to use that very often, but it's nice to have when that does occur. So basically two layers of antivirus, and this is a second layer of anti-spam. This takes a look at all of the email that's made it through this far, and it can categorize it as three different, uh, if it thinks it's gray mail, it can categorize it as marketing, social media, or bulk. And then this is yet another place where, because of these tags, we can treat them, we can treat these emails differently if we want to farther on down the pipeline. Then we have the admin defined content filters. This also is extremely flexible. You can look at any characteristics of an email that's made it this far, including tags that it's received from other layers, and decide what you want to do with it. Do you want to put a special banner on it? Do you want to remove all of the links and attachments? Because it might be kind of on the edge. Um, do you want to send it to a quarantine, either permanently or it temporarily until someone can take a look at it and see whether or not it was actually legit. So this is an example of a content filter and you can see it, it also is regex based. Um, the, the big difference is for the message filters you do it in the CLI, for the content filters you do it in the GUI. Uh, but that does also mean that with the message filters being in the CLI, they're a little bit more flexible. You can do a little bit more with not statements than you can with content filters. Um, so there's, there's, a, there's room for both of those uh, specific reasons to use one or the other. Um, but this is an example of a, a content filter that we have. The last stop that a message has in CES before it can be released to our on-prem exchange is what Cisco calls an outbreak filter. This is another area where Talos is constantly feeding information to CES. So if there might be something going on with an email that has certain characteristics, CES has the option at this point to hold that email in quarantine until it gets updated information from Talos. So five minutes later, it might get information saying, okay, so we had, we're holding all email with this broad criteria. We found out that it only affects email with this smaller criteria. So you can let go everything else that you had quarantined and just keep iterating through that uh, to try to determine whether or not that email might be malicious based on the latest breaking things that Talos is seeing out there. 
Um, I have had the question before, doesn't anyone complain about all of the delays that can happen at various stages with your incoming email? Since CES does have the option uh, in more than one place in the pipeline to hold on to that email for further analysis. I've been very fortunate in the year and a half that I've been administering the system, I haven't gotten any complaints related to that. Team Health is very security conscious and there is a lot of support all the way up to leadership for the initiatives that we have in the, in the realm of security. Um, so up to this point, I haven't had anybody notice anything being delayed that they've um, felt the need to complain about. For any infra nerds out there, this is a, a slide showing the infrastructure that we have with CES. With CES being in the cloud, um, it's in two, it's split between two Cisco data centers. So we've got six virtual ESAs split across the two data centers, all in one um, virtual cluster. The ESA part of CES is what does all of the actual work. So that's what processes the email. That's where all the configuration takes place with being able to look at, evaluate all of those, get all that updated information from Talos, decide whether or not to send that email through to Exchange. And then we have the one virtual SMA, which stands for Security Management Appliance, there in the middle. That's the centralized management piece. So we c that's for centralized reporting, centralized message log tracking. Uh, that's also where all of the quarantines are located. So whether it's a temporary quarantine from a layer in the process, or a, a quarantine just in case somebody might want it again, or a quarantine where I manual review them for false positives, all of that gets stored on the SMA. So there's one place to go to look at all of that information. There are a couple mentions here of EWS API. That is the path that CES can use to talk to Exchange for that auto remediation that I mentioned earlier. So for security reasons, we have it going through an AWS uh, web application firewall. Um, so it kind of it kind of hairpins, but that is two-way communication so that Exchange can talk back to CES and say whether or not that remediation worked. In addition to the auto remediation that I mentioned, we also have the option to do manual remediation. So if an email got through, maybe it was just a social engineering attempt. Um, and so there's, there's no attachment that CES might want to pull back, but we do want to get it out of user inboxes. We can go in and, and do that search, come up with that list, and request CES do a manual remediation as well. So that's another way to try to keep bad emails away from our end users. And we have to use that every once in a while. Another link here, we've got B2B VPNs between both of the Cisco data centers and the Team Health data center. The traffic that goes over those is syslog traffic. We have several logs that come down to a local collector for our SIM. And, and also um, LDAP traffic flows over that B2B VPN. CES checks to make sure that a recipient is valid before it will accept the email. So that's where all that traffic flows. CES is constantly talking to RAD to see whether or not the email addresses that are being sent at it are valid or not. And then the last part is the TLS version 1.2. Uh, Cisco does not give the uh, option to also use that B2B VPN for email traffic. So we, in, we require TLS version 1.2 so all of that email in between CES and Exchange is encrypted. So that's what that last part is, is just all the incoming and outgoing email. I've done a heck of a lot of talking. Are there any questions up to this point? Anything about um, CES or how we have it configured? Yes. Could you guys use the ALB and Proxy with the EWS API or use the cloud for the AWS Um I'm actually not 100% sure. I had some very smart people in the organization put that piece together for me. <laughs> <laughs>
All I know is it works. <laughs> Uh, they, there's a, a route in CES that points to um, an external IP address that's an added to Exchange. Um, so, yeah, they for email delivery, uh, CES um, and Exchange do talk directly. Yep, that SMTP handoff. Team Health is mainly US based. Um, so that's definitely the most important traffic that we allow. Uh, that we do get some email from other places and we have some contractors in India that do some work for us. So that is another country that has to be on the allow list. Um, I do have a, a long list of exceptions. So even Microsoft email sometimes get sourced from Europe, even if it's for a US company. So there, there definitely are a list of exceptions to those blocks, um, just, just in case. We've, we've got that capability, just in case the mail server accidentally sends from somewhere that we're blocking. Any other questions? Very good question. Uh, so the question was, is CS only for incoming email or does it also see internal only email and outgoing email? Uh, I'll start with outgoing email. Uh, all of our outgoing email does also filter out through CES. Um, so we have filters in place uh, just in case somebody internally were accidentally trying to send out a, a malicious link or a, a virus, we're going to catch that on its way out. Uh, we also um, have a limit on how many recipients our people can send to because we're trying to very hard to protect our IP address. We don't want to get blacklisted or labeled as spammers. So that also is part of our outgoing checks. If, you're tr if you have too many recipients on your email, um, you get a message back, denied. <laughs> Try again a different way. <laughs> uh, for internal only email, um, that's actually an excellent question that leads right into armor blocks. So I'll, CES doesn't see internal only email, which is a, a really good reason for us to have armor blocks, which I'll talk about next. We do, uh, we, we do have DLP enabled on CES. Uh, we don't have it completely locked down. We're not blocking anything based on that, but we are forcing encryption. So if it sees a certain, if it matches um, certain filters, it will first check and make sure that that is going to be sent via TLS. And if it's not, then it enforces envelope encryption. Any other questions? It's cool, thanks for all the great questions, guys. Now I'll talk about armor blocks as our second layer. Um, armor, blocks is, it, armor blocks doesn't even see the email until after it hits our Exchange server, but it talks to Exchange uh, via the EWS APIs, and it can remediate very quickly within a second or two. So usually when it sees an email that it deems as a threat, it can remediate that before a user even sees it in, the, in their inbox, which is nice. Um, this is a product that can see the internal only email. So that is very cool for us. It de definitely looks at all incoming email, anything that CES misses. It evaluates it to see if it's a threat. And it also can look at that internal only email so that if we ever did have an email account compromise, Armor Blocks could alert us that something was not looking right so we could look at it more closely. Another big feature that we use Armor Blocks for is what they call their abuse mailbox. So when an email comes in, we put a banner on it and we tell our users, if this looks suspicious at all, 
forward it to reportfishing at teamhealth.com. And that shows up the Armor Blocks abuse mailbox where we can take a closer look at it. It actually helps us analyze that email. It gives us information about the sender domain. It can show a little screenshot of what a, a link would look like if we were to click on it. And then we can make the evaluation there as to whether or not it's safe, market is safe, and let the user know that, or market for delete. And it is possible, the person who evaluates most of these is our security analyst. He has made a mistake before. He doesn't happen very often, he's awesome. But uh, for example, if he were to mark an email for delete and I look at it later, like it, that's actually a company that we do business with. We, we do need that email. We can just swap it back to mark a safe and Armor Blocks moves all those emails back from deleted items to the inbox. So it's really easy to change your mind if you need to after you make that initial evaluation of those potentially malicious emails. Uh, we do get a lot of reports to that mailbox that are actually legitimate emails. Um, some of our end users are hypersensitive to that sort of thing and we don't mind at all. I would way better spend five minutes looking at an email and then being able to say, no, that's actually okay, that's safe to interact with, then have a user take a chance and interact with an email that would be potentially bad. So no matter whether it's a, it was a safe email or a bad email, we always thank the users for reporting those because we want to, we want to see those. We want to know what's going on in our environment. Um, also, uh, so say it was a bad email that somebody reported. Armor Blocks will tell us that it matched on so many other emails that looked exactly like that. And when we set it to mark as delete, it deletes all of them at once. So it's not only deleting the one email that was reported, it's deleting all of the matching emails. There, uh, they're still working on that. They're doing some of that, um, but they're, they're still building out that. Uh, but right now you can get in there and see if they forwarded an email. Uh, we have had people that decide to not forward it only to report phishing, but forward it to all of their coworkers as well, just to get a, a wealth of input on the situation. So. <laughs> So we are able to see that in Armor Blocks. Where all did that email end up? Okay. All right, I've got one more slide here for infra nerds. Uh, what does Armor Blocks look like in our environment? Um, I had referred before that we had a, a kind of a somewhat unique situation with Exchange. We actually have two separate Exchange domains in our environment. One is for the admin side of Team Health and the other is for the clinician side of Team Health. The clinician number of mailboxes is way bigger but way lower volume because they often have their own personal email addresses that they're using or the email addresses assigned to them by the hospital that they're working with. Um, so. That's one of the reasons why it's cheaper for us to stay on prem at this point is because the clinician is so low volume that it doesn't make sense to pay for those mailboxes in 0365. Though, like I said before, I'm sure we're going to be heading there at, at some point. Armor Blocks doesn't currently have a way to look at both of those exchange domains at once. So we have two separate portals for Armor Blocks. So we do all the administration, all of the looking at it in the Armor Blocks cloud in their portal. Um, but on-prem, we've got three node Kubernetes clusters, that AEC that stands for Armor Blocks Exchange Connector. So those are virtual appliances um, that we have on our VMware servers along with load balance pair that talks directly to Exchange. So that's what that looks like. And we've got times two, one in each of the Exchange environments. Are there any questions about armor blocks? I kind of covered that a little fast.
Um, Armor Blocks does some of that, um, and one way that we've um, dealt with that as well is if CES, if it's not on a known list when it comes through CES, our email banner shows that envelope sender as well, which Outlook doesn't natively show, to give our users another clue that that is not coming from Team Health, that's not coming from a known address. Um, so CES can do some of that, Armor Blocks can do some of that, and then we also try to give that information to the end user as well to help them out. Oh, okay. All right, so I do not know what just happened to my PowerPoint presentation. Um, so the next thing I wanted to address quickly though is why both? Why do we have both of those? Couldn't one or the other do a good enough job? Uh, and in my opinion, I think they both have a, a really good place in our environment. CES, uh, while it's really good and it does get up-to-date information from Telus on a regular basis, it's still a SEG. It's still a relatively static, rule-based product. But it can filter a ton of bad email right off the top that then Exchange and Armor Blocks never have to deal with. They don't have to spend cycles on some hundreds of thousands of emails that CES just blocks. Um, but uh, Armor Blocks has that advanced signal analysis that they are constantly developing and rolling out updates for on a regular basis in order to be able to detect more zero days and more things that we can't catch with the static rules that we have in place on CES. So I consider both of them to be extremely important to our environment. Let me see if I can get my PowerPoint back. And then just to show you some numbers so that you can see what that looks like. Okay, this is a report that I generate for our leadership. I actually generate um, a weekly version of this for the CIO um, and then generate a, a monthly one that um, my manager can show at the, the leadership team meetings. Um, so this, this gives you some indication of the volume of email that we get to see. So in the month of April, uh, over 3.7 million emails were sent at us. CES decided that about 2 million of those were probably clean and good enough to let through. About 800,000 were spam and, rated spam and gray mail. And then it blocked over 900,000 emails right off the bat that never, that never had to be looked at by exchange. Just stopped cold. Up here, that is Armor Blocks and the threats that it caught. So that again, it's advanced signal analysis where it looks at every email that flows through exchange inboxes to try to figure out whether or not they're bad. Most of them it categorized as gray mail, but you can see during the month of April, it did also see things that met um, its other policies, credential phishing, payroll fraud, social engineering, VIP impersonation, and internal payment fraud. So those are some of the policies that Armor Blocks has, specific things that it's looking for, specific um, indicators and signals that it's looking for in emails. This down here is a report about the abuse mailbox that I mentioned. So there's a, there's a difference between um, email and instance, and I hope you guys can see that better than I can. Um, that, that writing looks very faint. But the difference between emails and incidents is an incident is one thing that was caught, whereas emails is how many, um, how many things did it match in the environment. So there might have been uh, one incident of VIP impersonation, but the sender sent in 12 of those bad emails. So that counts as one incident and 12 emails. So that also ties into this report to abuse, 
we had 122 emails reported by our end users, and that matched over 31,000 emails that we were then e able to mark as either safe or mark for delete. And you can see um, between the two of those, at least the way we crunched the numbers for this report, the misses by both scanners is half a percent. So it's, we're looking at a very large number of emails, um, and, and that's a pretty good percent, but as I said, you know, the goal is zero. I want, I want zero misses, and that's what I'm working toward every day with filter tweaks. Um, and then one other number I was going to mention, so the emails analyzed there for armor blocks, obviously that's much bigger than the two million emails that CS let in, so that does include incoming email, outgoing email, and internal only email, whereas the CES numbers only include the incoming email. So what happens if both Cisco and Armor Blocks miss the bad email? They try really, really hard, but it still gets through. We have more Cisco. Um, at Team Health, we really like Cisco, so we have lots of their different products. We have Secure Endpoint, formerly known as AMP, so that's on our endpoints, um, keeping an eye out for any malicious attachments that might have come in. Cisco Umbrella, that is a DNS product. It has categories that we have marked to block by default. It also blocks newly seen domains. And there's a custom block list that we maintain. So if an email comes in, but it made it through with a bad link, we've got that option of blocking it with umbrella. And like I said, some of those are blocked automatically. And then we also have Cisco Firepower. And the main thing that we're using that for related to this is, again, geo-blocking. That operates with a blacklist, a ver block list versus an allow list. Um, but for example, uh, Russia, again, if, if that web server is located in Russia, you're not going to be able to get to it. And then just other best practices, which, you know, this isn't rocket science or anything mind-blowing for you, but the, this is also a consideration. If that bad email gets through, it, is the end user going to be able to do something with it? So remove the local admin permission just in case there's a, a bad um, attachment or a bad download, especially with ransomware being all over the place. Um, we've had a lot of partner organizations get hit with ransomware in the past year. So limit your east to west traffic in your network with microsegmentation. Multi-factor authentication. If a user clicks the link and gives their username and password to the wrong website, don't make that be an automatic open door for the cyber criminal. And then security awareness training. You need to help give your users the information and confidence to be able to make those calls as to whether or not that email may or may not be bad. Um, and just to mention, this isn't specifically email security, but this is my favorite book that I've run across so far related to cybersecurity. It's written for a layperson, but it inspired me to improve my cyber hygiene. There's lots of good information in there. After I got done reading it, I lent it to my dad and he incorporated some of the suggestions as well, um, which made my mother very unhappy because uh, now she can't figure out what any of the passwords are, but they are safer. <laughs> So if you have people in your life that aren't, don't seem very concerned about cyber hygiene and they are readers, this is a great present for them or you can read it and try to slip some of the information to them in conversation. For example, my Uncle Mark, completely unconcerned about cyber hygiene. He doesn't care if anybody gets access to his email because he doesn't have any important information in there. So I tried to explain to him, but what about all of your contacts? If a bad guy gets access to your email account and starts sending out emails as you, those people are gonna trust you and click. So for the benefit of everyone that you love, Uncle Mark, please take this a little bit more seriously. So this is, this is a great read um, in regards to that, recommended for all levels. 
So I've talked through why Team Health is a target, and then CES and Armor Blocks as our main tools for that, and all of our other layers of defense that we have in place at Team Health. Are there any other questions? Okay, great. Thank you so much for your time this morning.